Sure. All right. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we got Pat Fraley on the line. Pat, well, I guess it's not really a line so much anymore as it is a computer. Pat, how are you doing today? I'm okay. It's going to be hot. It's in Palm Desert, California, 105. Oh, man, I'm in Florida, and it's a beautiful 72 degrees right now. It's our second and only day of uh, winter, fall, what they we're going to get here in Florida. So it's a nice yeah. change of pace. So. Well, I'm really happy to hear you're doing so well. <laughs> so as most of you guys know that have watched the Turtles or have any kind of connection with this franchise, you know Pat did not only Baxter, he did Casey, and he did Crane. Which of those three – like, which one of those three made you feel the most, uh, I guess, engaged with the character? Well, I uh, Krang, because I did about 200 shows of Krang, and then, of course, I did about 40 or 50 other characters because Fred Wolf didn't like guests because he was frugal. Is that the word? <laughs> That's a pretty frugal. good word. <laughs> right. And so but then I picked up. Burn Thompson and Casey Jones and Slash the Turtle and all these other characters because we fleshed out our our um, um, our contract for three characters on everything in those days. Yeah, and so we all did a lot. Now, when back in those days, were you? Is it anything like now? Because you see a lot of people battling with uh, with actors and actresses. They can and can't do certain things. Would you were allowed to go and do other cartoons when you had these three in a contract? Or do you have to finish out episodes or your time with uh, that specific cartoon before you could do that? Julian, are you nudging up against this whole thing about casting, you know, like a white guy in an African-American part, this kind of thing, or not? No, no, no like, uh, like for some things that they won't uh, – so – just a little example, Justice League a few years ago when that was shot, um, Henry Cavill was shooting a movie and they wanted him to shave his mustache to come back and play Superman. The other company said, no, we're not going to have that. So I didn't know if it was contract disputes, like you couldn't work on multiple projects at the same time, or you'd have to finish your voice acting for a specific cartoon. Was it anything like that? No. You know, we used to do a lot of different shows. In fact, I had up to nine at once hmm. in the, I think in the 80s when things got really wild and woolly there were some things like I was in the original Ghostbusters mm -hmm. done by uh, Filmation and I couldn't do the real Ghostbusters yeah but I did anyway you know <laughs> I did a couple shows anyway but th those kind of things but not there's no uh, grievances, and certainly they don't care about what you look like. You see the worst two pays and the highest lifts in the world <laughs> in voiceover. So we don't, we we didn't have a lot of problems that way. Now, so what was? Because um, you said Krang was fun. Is there somebody that you you not so much wanted to play, um, but it was like somebody you like? I don't know if I'll get a character, and you you really found that you liked that character. Was there any of those side characters? There were a lot of characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I loved playing Ray Filet. <laughs> now, he was a guest on one show, but they let me do anything I wanted, and I did my bad Marlon Brando. So I was like, I don't go. I, <laughs> I love that. I love Slash, who was a turtle that was. Now, all I did, Julian, before the show is they'd show me a picture. Here, look. And I go, what? What's Casey Jones? Okay, what do you want? Well, young Clean Eastwood. And so I go, hello, Violator. Really? You know, it was fast. And for Slash, I loved, you know, going back to what I really loved, is that they showed me this picture of this turtle with these splayed out teeth and told me he was insane. Well, the splayed out teeth told me I, I had to talk like this, right? <laughs> and then I thought, well, Praise. How about Kirk Douglas? He's always got a little insane. Bert, I gotta go. Yo, I did slash that way. Where's my pinky? So that was the way things were thrown against the wall uh, for a lot of the work I did. And I enjoyed some of that stuff. And I've always, Julian, been a character voice actor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started in theater. I was trained, went to six years of college, Cornell. I migrated to Australia to do Shakespeare. And then I started doing funny voices and character voices. I was like, never me. I only, of the hundreds of cartoon shows I've done, I've only done two uh, heroes. Yeah. 
One of them was uh, Cowboys of Moo Mesa, and one of them was Brave Star. Yeah. Now, when you had, uh, you said when you were getting into it, you started with theater, then Shakespeare. Did you, you hear stories about kids when they're coming up, Robin Williams is a perfect example. Like he would always do funny voices. He'd make something funny to make his parents laugh. Were you that kid as well? Yeah, totally. I mean, when I was four years old, I wanted to be a, a performer and a teacher. Mm. And I, I already was. I mean, they loved shooting me playing army because I died so well. <laughs> and after I died, I go, okay, here's what you arch your back and fall my little and say something like, ah, von Lieber. Yeah. <laughs> and so, from the get-go, I was that guy. Plus, uh, my grandpa was so, and my grandmother were so encouraging. Everyone was, but they were really encouraging. And my mom would say, Pat, go downstairs and put the tea cozy on your head and do your Chinese man. <laughs> so I'd come up to the uh, living room and ad-lib some stupid, embarrassing thing, which I'll never do now. Yeah. And they loved it. So, uh, I was lost like most of us do in junior high. I didn't know who I was or where I was going. And um, by the time high school came around, there were theater. And for a tall, reasonably good looking, middle-class white guy, we had theater. Yeah. We didn't have um, um, comedy stores. We didn't have uh, improv. It was theater or nothing. Yeah. So that's where I went. Now, when you but I always had in the back of my mind, Julie. I'm sorry that yeah. I'm a funny guy. Yeah, and that's always been a good stead in in cartoons. So I, I talked to I was talking to Rob Paulson the other day, and the first question I asked him because he came on and he was doing a whole bunch of voices because we were sitting in there, and uh, my kid didn't know him from the Ninja Turtles. He knew him from Carl Weezer and Jimmy Neutron, that whole croissant line. And then, you know, he always asked me who I'm interviewing for the day and I tell him and then he just looked at me weird. He's like, I don't know who that name is. I was like, no, we've watched Jimmy Neutron. He's Carl. And then he rattles off into that, into that line. Uh, it Carl. <laughs> yeah. uh, and he, I asked him a question that I, that I, I think I'm going to have to start asking all of you voice actors and actresses that I, I interview. What is Thanksgiving like with you? I mean, I can only imagine there's so many voices just being yeah. shot off. No, no you're totally wrong. No, if I did a voice from my house, they would not get it. My <laughs> wife wouldn't get it, my kids. I mean, I never used voices. They didn't even know what I did until they shared me at school and I did a little prank and everyone crazy. And they turned around like, what? Hey, that's my dad. <laughs> they, they thought that I just did funny voices in my bunkhouse in the back of my house. And then Rob would come over when they were little. They're yeah. all in the 30s, but when they were like 10 or younger, Rob would come over and do a cappella the country song. Yeah. Brad Garrett would come over. Our next door neighbor, uh, my mentor and dear friend, Ed Asner, mm -hmm. who they know from up, younger people, rather than Lou Grant from Mary Tyler Moore. He was our next door neighbor, and they got mad when they found out he was an actor. They'd go over and play with his Emmys and, you know, they thought they flew. They went, Uncle Ed, he's an actor. I saw his face at Blockbuster on a box. You know, no, and it wasn't, Thanksgiving is uh, probably as boring as it gets. Although yeah. my wife has a good sense of humor. You remember when John McLean, I think it was, or who, not John McLean, that's a, that's a student. Um, McLean uh, ran for office. What was his name? Oh, I'm not very good with politics. My brain okay, worked well, for comic books, movies, and, and uh, food, so I'm pretty much okay. tapped out. <laughs> he was a Republican, and all my boys are not Republican. So she bought a poster of him and put him at the Thanksgiving dinner, and oh, they were upset. And she put it in front of the shower, in bed, or out the window. That's her sense of humor. But that's Was it, was it McCain? Yeah. John McCain. Okay. Yeah. John so McCain. I, 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 or, yeah. I remember. I remember his name because he you know, on TV and shit like that. He would just go back and forth. Um, I wish my wife. It's not that she doesn't have a sense of humor. We've been married eleven years now. We've got a ten-year-old, almost twelve years, um, and uh, doesn't find me funny. I think I'm hilarious. I think I'm a riot ninety percent of the time. 
Uh, my kid thinks I'm funny, so I don't know if it's just little kid humor that I have, but uh, she's very good at keeping me grounded and not literally, but figuratively and humbled uh, quite often. Everybody laughs and she just sits there and why did I marry you type of look, you know? So Well, I got that. Uh, Renee is a, you know, fine artist background and she gets what I do, but she could care less. Yeah. And in fact, the only thing she finds funny is when I'm in pain or humility. <laughs> I remember having a salad in Honolulu at the, re at the uh, airport. Mm -hmm. And this is when I had the first set of veneers, which were thin shells mm -hmm. that went over your teeth. Yeah. So I'm having a salad and I go, what's this? And I pull out a veneer and I have a gray tooth underneath and she <laughs> laughed like a donkey. <laughs> I had to go to the bathroom. I was so upset, yeah. you know, to get away from her. But that's, that's the, and all my kids are kind of have a strange sense of humor too, but they never laugh really at stuff that other people have laughed at all my life and really been central to my career. And that's being a, a comedian. Yeah. Well, speaking of comedians, cause I'm a real big fan of stand up. Um, who are some of your stand up heroes or influences or who would be on your Mount Rushmore, I guess is a better question. If you could pick four of them, who would you pick up and look for? Well, I, I, you know, I never did stand up because, uh, as I mentioned, I, I grew up in theater. And yeah. by the time I got a career, I had a career in a living room and a wife. Why would I do stand up? Yeah. Uh, I should have, but I didn't. But if if I were to think of great stand up or great comedians, I think Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. George Carlin, Jim Carrey. Um. C.K., is that correct? Oh, uh, Louis C.K. Louis C.K. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Chris Rock's mind. Yeah. You know, yeah, I guess that's where I'd go. And I suppose it's areas, either I work with them, uh, like I work with Robin Williams, it's either, I, it's ways I use what they have, which is brilliant and genius, yeah. in what I do. I guess there's a connection there. Yeah, but I, I saw, you know, my, my uh, heroes are really like Charles Lawton and Ruth Draper, who come from theater and movies. But uh, yeah, to answer your question, there's four or five that I think are are geniuses. See, I've only met three creative geniuses. I work with Jonathan Winters, mm -hmm. and I don't put him in the stand-up category, but there, that's one guy. I knew a guy named John Hostetter from acting school who was a creative genius. No matter what he did, he was creative. And yeah. Walter Crowley. Now, they're all three get dead. Yeah. You know, so, but they were creative geniuses. You couldn't say anything. They couldn't do anything without being creative. Just on all the time, just firing. Well, it wasn't so much on performance like Jim Carrey, which I love. Yeah. It was just that they, you know, if they wore a pair of jeans, you know, or, or embroidered something, or that it was just unique. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, you bring up uh, Robin Williams. Uh, he's one of, he's by far my favorite actor of all time. Um, I grew up with his movies, and, you know, since his passing, it's been real hard to watch anything he's done because it's just, it brings up that, that real, you know, bad spot of, of his life, the worst, worst time of his life. You know, but I showed my son, which is my favorite uh, Robin Williams movie, Mrs. Doubtfire, not too long ago. And I've never seen, because I was about his age when I saw it for the first time. I've never seen somebody just latch on to something and laugh. And then you see it like, oh, man, I wonder if that's what I was like at 10 years old, seeing this movie right. for the first time. You know, and that guy was just always on, always on, always on. And uh, he yeah. was, and he was, uh, and also it shows how universal humor is. Because I, I did a play in uh, Malaysia mm. uh, when I was living in Australia, and they were laughing at all the jokes. You know, they, it's humor they get. And, and I got to work with Robin Williams in Fisher King. Yeah, great movie. I work, actually worked with uh, uh, Jeff Bridges, mm -hmm. didn't work with Robin, but it's one of my favorite performances of his. It was interesting to see that it, just with you guys in general, how you guys can go from completely manic to something that's completely off the table 
and then it's just a flip of a switch or it's 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 the the nod it's all the subtleties that go into it and then seeing him mrs doubtfire and then something like fisher's king or goodwill hunting or yeah. insert any movie that wasn't a comedy it was just i've never seen anything like it man i, I really like that um we got off on a tangent there but it was robin williams so it's okay well, I'll tell you what, just to continue, Julian, I think that true creative geniuses or people that are like Robin Williams or, you know, Chris Rock, they can't be cast. They have to be realized. Yeah. And that's why Robin Williams is, is uh, hot and cold. He's brilliant or it's like, eh. Yeah. Because they try, or, or Jonathan Winters, because they try to put him in a box and you can't put people like that in a box. They'll make their own box. Yeah, you just got to let them go. Yeah. Just, just seeing outtakes on some of these guys just doing stuff, just riffing, having a good time. You know, it, it, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, it's not Turtles related, but it's you, you played a little bit of – played some voices in one of my sh one of my favorite cartoons growing up, and it's uh, something that's never really talked about, but Fantastic Max. Do you remember that cartoon? Yes, I think so. It was English, right? Yeah, it was, uh, it was about a little baby. His name was Max. And he, his bottle would turn into a spaceship and he would go and have other, other, other uh, adventures and stuff like that. Was there a bone, a skeleton guy in it? Uh, I'm not sure when I'm looking, when I look through your, uh, I don't know if it's Fantastic Max. Was it done in Hanna-Barbera? Yeah, it was, uh, it was released under that one back in the eight, I think it was 88 to 89, 90. It was a very short lived cartoon. But it's yes, I think it was English. Yeah. And they brought one cast member over, and I somehow got cast because I sounded like or I could do one of the characters. Mm -hmm. And I, I really enjoyed it. It was well written. But it was an English show that somehow Hanna-Barbera or Ted Turner, whoever owned Taft, whoever owned Hanna-Barbera at that time did. Yeah. Hanna-Barbera had such, it was just, you know, there, and, and the young lingo, it's banger after banger. It's something great, 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 great. And it's looking back, I mean, from Fantastic Max to a pup named Scooby-Doo to the Flintstones and Jetsons, they had so many cartoons. Did you ever get to meet um, any of them? Yes, I met them all. Yeah? What were they like? I I all you know? I'll tell you why, because I'm 71 now, and I came to LA when I was 30, mm -hmm. and that was 1979. And I was able to work with and get to know the first generation of voiceovers, mm -hmm. people that came from radio and from TV. And so I worked with uh, Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler, and June Foray, Don Messick. And I did, I was in the cast of the Jetsons. I was in the cast of the Flintstones. You remember the bird they used to uh, use to play the phonograph? Yeah. I'm in fact my union about this. <laughs> I got to be that part. And I was in the Jetsons. I played Judy Jetson's boyfriend, Skyhawk Mike, who is like a drummer. And, um, you know, uh, that was a, a wonderful thing because I remember going to Don Messick, who was, you know, he started with Head of Barbera in 1958 yeah. with Don Messick. And they were there when I got there in 79 and continued on. And he was the best uh, voiceover person in the history of voiceover. He, uh, Mel Blanc was more dynamic. Mm -hmm. He was a better actor. Yeah. So Dawes is like 70 plus, had a stroke, and he's doing Elroy, the little boy on the Jetsons. Yeah. And I went up to him and I went, and he couldn't even read his lines. He had to memorize them a little bit. I said, Dawes, how do you do this? How do you play a seven-year-old when you're 74? And he said, well, you have to think everything's new. <laughs> I was like, hey, Dad, where's Astro? Like, Astro's never been gone before. What's for dinner? Like, he's never had dinner before. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's always crazy to see how somebody gets an influence or how somebody goes and takes what you were saying earlier. They show you a picture and then you're thinking, well, what do you want? Or what would it sound like? Um, yeah. Do they give you, not so much give you direction, but do they say what they want all the time? Or is it just something like, ah, come up with something and we'll just riff? Well, when you, when you get cast in a role, uh, chances are you're going to have one at least or two more characters to do. Mm -hmm. So you get there and you sit down and you get to your line as, you know, guard number four or mm -hmm. the Scottish, you know, slot machine. <laughs> and they go, okay, Pat, what do you got? It's like, we're stunt people. What, what do I got? I'm, I'm going to jump through a 
candy glass window and roll three times. <laughs> and so I would write down usually three things because I go, whoa, I was thinking about, no, no, we got that. Oh, wow, I was thinking about, no, 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 well, that's a little bit like, and then I have a third, and I say, I have a third, but you don't want to hear it. And they go, go ahead. And then they would choose that one. Yeah. Now, uh, it happened a lot in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. By the way, uh, I probably got worked more with Rob Paulson than anybody in the world mm -hmm. uh, in animation because we were nine years together seated next to each other in Mutant Ninja Turtles. Then we did Bobby's World and we did okay. this and that. We were just good together because he's a high tenor. Mm -hmm. I'm a lower, bar I'm a baritone. Yeah and versatile so they can put us together no matter what and we were okay but the only reason why we ad-libbed and we loved to ad-lib both the two of us the only we would ad-lib ninja turtles when it first came out like crazy yeah. and our only objective and the reason why if you enjoyed that show or enjoyed rob was his job and my job were to amuse each other mm -hmm. It's like fifth graders in the back of the room. All we want to do, all I want to do, is make Rob laugh. Are you working with Rob again on the new Animaniacs? No, I'm not. I'm not. I didn't. I can't sing, and he sings like a bird. It, it, it's you heard him sing? Yeah, it, it's one of the. I always posted questions to to all the fan pages so I can get you know if you guys could sit down and talk with insert here. We're talking to Pat today. What would you ask him? And when I put that picture up there for Rob, they, were, they asked how many times did he almost or did he pass out singing Yakko's World at two and a half. So and he's like, luckily, I was a singer beforehand. So, you know, it was, it was very easy. It was something I was very fluid with. And I could jump right into. And he was like, and it was like the first time I did it, that was the first song you see is the first take. And I'm like, you've got to be shitting. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. I'm dead serious. And I was like, God, that is amazing. He's a one take guy. And you talk about somebody fast all jumping in and out of character. Oh my goodness. He's, he's terrific at it. It always has been, but I've seen him get better because I started working with him when he was, I mean, we all, we still, Brad Garrett, who was my friend and was everyone in Lovers Raymond was Rob, you know, um, he, we all call him young Rob mm -hmm. still <laughs> to this day. Cause he was in his twenties. It's young Rob. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, I've seen him get so good because, for example, um, he does one of those characters, Rock Steady or Bebop. Which one yeah. is it? Uh, I want to say it's Bebop, but I know him and him and Barry. Let me look it up real quick. Um, okay, but, but he plays one of them. Now they're huge characters. One's a rhino and one's a bull, I think, or something like that. Oh, so you'd think. Of course, I was fleshed out with characters I had. I had so many characters because I took over somebody's role. But you'd think they'd get somebody big like Rocksteady and Bebop, right? <laughs> and Barry Gordon is like that. And my cousin, Cam Clark, by the way, is a, is a high tenor. So that, but they gave him to them. And I went, oh, this is going to be horrible. But Rob, just jumping to Rob, was so able to, at a high tenor, to do a thug, like a thug, you know, I'd go low. Yeah. No, he does stupid and high. <laughs> and he was able to um, realize roles that you think he'd be wrong for. Yeah. But he never was wrong for anything. Man, it, it's, it's just fantastic what you guys can and can't do. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, you say he slips in and out and you guys slip in and out of uh, voices, do you ever hear yourself? When you guys were doing these episodes, you said a lot of it riffing. Would you ever have to go like, oh man, that was not Baxter, that was Krang. Did you guys ever have something like that? Or was it- No, pretty no. And, and I think to be able to go back and forth and versatile, you can't be too bright. <laughs> you can't, I don't think Daniel Day-Lewis could be Dinky the Duck and then uh, Baxter's <laughs> pocket. I think we'd have days. Yeah. And part of it is that's good and bad. You know, it's just the way it is. You know, um, I can talk to you like this. Rock and talk to you like this. All right, I can do this. Or it can go this way. It doesn't, I don't, I'm not thinking what to do. I'm just doing it. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I just slide into it. And I don't know what it is. But I, I it can't be being too deep. No, yeah, I, I guess so. It's just, it's always seeing 
when somebody does something well, right? It's, it's, you can appreciate the hell out of it. But when you see somebody and it's not done well, you're like, ah. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> if you watch a plumber put in a new cistern float head, it's amazing. Especially when you can't, like, you're like me. I, I, my wife can, I, I was in the Navy, so I was deployed all over the place. So we bought this house back in 2011. And then she completely, from the ground up, changed everything in this house from the tile to the granite to the cabinets with her dad and her mom and stuff like that right so i come home and then she's like all right well, we're fixing this and it just happened to be plumbing so we were switching out a toilet and then i'm just a, i'm a big guy so i don't know what to do i'm sitting there holding stuff and we're trying to load it up and then she's like have you never done this before i'm like uh -uh, nope never i was like my dad wasn't in the picture i didn't learn this you know so she's like all right well go get me whatever tool it was. So I go and get it and it was the wrong tool. I went back three, four or five times. Finally, she said, screw this. I'm going to get up and do it myself. And I was like, what do you want me to do? She's like, there's boxes for the toilet. Take them out of the trash can. It'll be a big help. <laughs> Julian, uh, my dad didn't have a dad. Mm -hmm. and so he grew up in the South and, you know, like he, he never had tools. And so, you know, we always said, oh, I know where the crescent wrench is, the backyard on the lawn. <laughs> so I am totally unhandy. When my, my wife is very handy, mm -hmm. and when, but when she say, you know, I'd like to get a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And I go, good. I call my agent go, my wife needs a swimming pool. Give me some more. <laughs> Give me a show. That's a show. It's a 50 grand show. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. So maybe that's part of it. I don't know. I, I know some actors that are handy and then other, like Harrison Ford is just great cabinetry work and beautiful stuff but i don't know anything about that stuff like i said i think it's just you can your brain's only built for so much and you can only hold on to so much and you know between birthdays i'm so glad phones exist now because i don't have to remember anybody's phone number anymore <laughs> uh, i don't have to know where i'm going i can just type it into google and then magically we end up there 30 to 45 minutes later um, you know, so it's nice yeah. with YouTube now. It's great because you can figure out how to do something on YouTube um, in 15, 20 minutes, and then you look like a professional. So, right. This 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 time and age has definitely gotten a lot better with you know faking it until you make it. You know, and I, I like maybe that a lot. maybe, and I think that old people should more learn technology like crazy. I mean, it's better than the gun for equalizing. <laughs> Yeah, you can shut down a lot of stuff with just a little, with a little tap and typing on a computer, you know. So that's right. Yeah. Um, there was a uh, another thing that you had done um, that I I really liked, and you talked about it earlier, and you were talking about teaching. What was that spark for teaching that you really wanted to dive into? Well, God gave me a, a passion for teaching and for performing. Mm -hmm. And I can't explain it beyond that, but I love teaching. And I do more teaching now than ever before. I teach all over the world, UK, um, Australia, any English speaking people. I have home, about 30 home study courses mm -hmm. and everything is there, including free lessons and my email, everything on my website, patfraley.com. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I just, I just, I never lose patience. Uh, and I always enjoy my work. I don't know. That's a gift. Yeah. The, you know, you can't make that up. You always talk about performing, getting the bug, but uh, I think it's put there beforehand. You bump into it and you go, oh, yeah, this works. Yeah. What was that? What, what led you to it, towards it? You know, I guess you came in with voice acting, but what was that final push? Was it something you'd always thought about or was it something that had just came, come up at the, at the right time or? Well, a couple things. First of all, I've never voice acted. It's always character voice all the way. They just pay for the voice. <laughs> okay. And second, I never thought of being a voiceover actor. In fact, I was in Australia doing Shakespeare, which was not paying a whole lot. I kept a role playing, playing some, you know, some rat dog on a commercial. I went in and did it. And of course, they paid me the same amount of money only for a one hour versus a week. Ooh. And I thought, oh, this is good. Yeah. And I, I start to leave and I hear, oh, the producer go, we like you. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Why? And they're, oh, you're so big. We can't get the other actors to be that big. <laughs> and then I went, okay, I want to be a performer. It doesn't matter what. 
And within a few years, I was at Hanna-Barbera doing cartoons. I always had a gift of being, doing big, highly committed, uh, outrageous characters that were motivated. The motivation came from learning how to act. But I could, I could commit to them without, you know, you want a you know, Frankenstein duck? Good, here it is. I, I had nothing to say. Well, what do you mean by Frankenstein? Now, I just did it. I always had that, but I could commit to big, huge, high form characters because I think actors are getting into the business for two different reasons. One is either to reveal or two is to hide. And I got in for the latter. I wanted to be anybody but me. There wasn't enough putty, there wasn't enough fake beards or wigs or hunchbacks, and there was, there was not enough to hide myself enough. Well, man, you got such this, this great personality. You would think you'd want to not so much hide, but show that. You know? Yeah. Why, why do you think you wanted to, to hide? Neuroses. Uh, <laughs> I think early on in my life, somewhere along the line, I didn't like myself. I didn't want people to know me. I wanted to hide. I don't know why. I was damaged. Oh, I think one neuroses I had as a kid was and it had to do with the death of a chicken and me being frightened and not telling a, telling a dog not to do it, but the dog did it anyway. I won't go into the details. But I think that was a moment where I said, Pat, you can't control your life. Hmm. You're out of control. And what I learned by watching Red Skelton, who was on TV and had a little different characters, and Jackie Gleason, who had the portable soul and other characters, is that I can control my characters. So I would gather them like little geese and I could control them. And that wasn't enough. I had to, I could be funny as a duck, but how do I do it? Hmm. So there's this analytical side too that I've always carried with me my whole career. So those two things, I think, um, as far as like, those, no, that, those neuroses, kind of probably advanced me. How do you feel about yourself these days? Do you feel like you've got more of a control? No. No? I feel like I have less control, but I, I believe in God. And so that gives me such a, a powerful look at joy mm -hmm. and knowing that I am not in charge. I mean, I, I think about people and I feel so bad about they're not in charge. Yeah. You know, I go on Facebook and I see our president gets COVID-19 and people are happy. Yeah. And I'm thinking, no, we need to pray for him to know our Lord and, and be strength and his doctor's wisdom. Yeah. You know, there's so much anger and, be, and it's all based on, uh, oh no, what do I do now? Yeah. Good luck, you know, good luck with the, doing it now. Yeah, it, it's just these days I don't understand. I guess maybe it's just, in this time where we're so more connected than we've ever been in our lives, we seem so much more distant and it's so much easier to say something behind a screen or on a keyboard than it is to say in real life. And I just wish, you know, if anything comes from any, this whole year has sucked. You know, there's been so many people that have been lost. It's felt like two years. Um, you know, if anybody can learn anything, hopefully it's patience, like you, you were saying earlier, hopefully it's some kind of forgiveness and to an extent. And then hopefully, right. if anything, we can just treat each other like your parents taught you to, man. You know? well, well, I'll tell you what, Julian, and not to go too far on this, but I heard somebody say, well, maybe he needed to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with his four-year-old at two in the afternoon anyway. <laughs> So the, the, the good news, the glass full, uh, half full, is that we're thinking about, what have you been doing? What are you doing now? Yeah. What are you up to? Now that you're not, you know, doing that, um, what are you doing? Yeah. And so there is, and of course, introspection can go way too far, way too fast. By the way, Julian, if you wake up and you wake up in the morning and go, how are you feeling today, Julian? That's okay. Just don't answer yourself. <laughs> because it's crazy. But, but having the time to go, hmm, you know, what's it all about, Alfie? That's real important. And I think it's a positive thing. And believe me, it, the negatives are lined up. Yeah. I mean, people are a little insane. 
They just go little. a little cuckoo. And yeah. they go through eras where they get happy, they do silly stuff, then they get down, they get depressed, and then they get angry. You know, we're all going through a phase, and you can see it on Facebook. Yeah. You know, then, then they don't talk, then they talk too much, you know. Mm. And it's always those peaks and valleys, um, you know, to to kind of steer it back towards you. You had one, well, I'll tell you one thing and steering that? back, Julian. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons why I'm fairly sane is because of doing the insane work I've done all my life. Being <laughs> able to find a place to scream and yell and to be happy and to be angry and evil, all that. I think uh, acting is like the best therapy ever. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably equivalent. I wouldn't say equivalent to working out. But I noticed me and my wife have started to get better at eating, better at working out. You know, she's lost a whole bunch of weight, switching to a nice diet. Um, right. It's when you get out there and you run or you get out there and walk, you're exerting all of that extra energy you had built up. And I can imagine you just being in a booth screaming through the rafters or sitting there trying to make somebody laugh, trying to get one of the other boys or girls in the room to pop, you know, yeah. get all that expended energy. You know, Maybe that's so. why when I went home, I go, hi, honey, what's your dinner? <laughs> Maybe that's how I am so boring around my family. Well, speaking of dinner, man, I'm a, I'm a, people are going to hate when I say this because I've said it like three or four times because it's come up, but I, I love talking about food. I'm a chef by trade, but what is your wife's, what is your favorite dish that your wife makes or is it a dessert or what, what is your favorite or go-to dish that she does? Well, we've been married, uh, I met her at 18 mm -hmm. and we're, we've been married for over 40 years and we're both 71. When I met her, she couldn't cook anything. <laughs> she couldn't burn water. Yeah. Um, but, um, and now one of our boys, who is really a wonderful chef, is home and he's making meals and I'm going, what is this? You know, <laughs> it's so good. Um, I don't have a favorite uh, that I request, although my wife makes a great pizza by hand. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. she put, but it's basically all fresh stuff. Yeah. You know, and for like this morning, she made me a rice bowl mm -hmm. with a scrambled egg on top and some sliced sausage. Oh, man. Uh, you know, it was terrific. But um, she's, a, she's a very uh, a good cook in as much as you taste everything and nothing is mixed and globbed on. Yeah, that's awesome. My wife... It's funny, ever since I started cooking, I've been cooking since I was 12. Um, you know, I originally wanted to start out and do what you guys did. Um, I always liked, you know, making people laugh with funny voices or making somebody just feel weird by an awkward voice, you know, that weird kid in the back of the classroom type of thing. And then it kind of went to more animation because I saw somebody drawing. I'm like, I see something. I'm like, I think I could do that. And it got to the point where I would do it, but I could never create, you know, I could always see something, draw it, but I was like, I can't really do this. And then cooking came around. There's a guy by the name of Emeril Lagasse that was on oh, yeah. Emerald Live. And I'm just flipping channels. My mom was working two jobs at the time. And uh, I'm just sitting there flipping channels. And I see this guy and I see him throwing seasoning, right? About 10, 15 feet away. And then everybody going crazy. I'm just sitting there looking like, what the hell is going on? These, he's got these people captivated. It's, it's like he had a spell on them. And I'm like, he's doing this with food. And I had been to restaurants before, but I'd never sat here and been like, man, I could sit here and work it out back. You know, I could work at McDonald's. I never, you know, saw that, but I see somebody on TV and this is what they're doing. And I'm like, man, this seems fun. This seems cool. I can do that. And that's yeah. kind of what went down. And now my wife won't cook for me at all. Like she'll bake cause she likes bacon. Um, but the, the one real big, you know, kick in the groin is my mom won't cook for me anymore. Anytime I come home or she comes over, I'm like, Hey, are you going to make those pork chops and fried potatoes? She's like, no. And I'm like, why not? And she's like, your food's better. I'm not going to cook for you. I'm like, Oh, this is the oh, biggest, no. this is the biggest scapegoat. This is the biggest out I've ever heard making me yeah. do more work, but you pushed me out of you. So I guess I can, I guess I can cook you dinner tonight. <laughs> Well, the good news yeah. for me is they know I can't cook, so they always take this spatula away from me. I've learned you can screw up a lot of stuff, and that never, like I said, with my wife helping with the uh, with the toilet, she'll never let me touch a toilet by myself um, if we're making one. So I guess I lucked out in a sense, you know. So it's something. It's like that old story about the best thing a man can do in the kitchen is break a dish. Then he'll never have to wash <laughs> dishes again. I tried that; it didn't work. Oh, so 
That's my least favorite part about anything in the kitchen is cl cleaning and cooking. The, or me too. The me too. I'm, you know, I was a bachelor long enough. I learned how to uh, eat out of a pot mm -hmm. and have, you know, like one fork to clean. You know? <laughs> and, uh, when, I, when I was in the Navy, I had a roommate and he was against cleaning. <clears throat> excuse me. He was against cleaning completely. A uh, horrible slob. And uh, he had one plate, one knife, one fork, one spoon, one cup. And then he would, he would rinse it off and he would put it in the freezer. And I would look at him one time, I'm like, why are you doing that? He's like, well, the freezer kills all of the bacteria. And I'm like, well, so does soap. And then, you, you know, your freezer won't stink. And he was like, ah, be all right. He told me it builds character, it builds immunity. So I was like, uh -huh. I've never seen you sick. So I guess you're right. But I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not abiding by that kind of law. Right. Uh, but uh, one of the other voices that you had, you had done was Cousin It. Now, growing up, I wasn't. I wasn't so much an Adams Family guy as I was a Munsters guy because I'd have these great aunts and uncles that would come down and they'd watch us for the summer and we watched everything on TV land. Yeah. Um, since you did Cousin It, were you more of a fan of Adams Family or were you a Munsters kid or a Munsters guy? Neither, but you know, here I am cast in Adams Family. I look around the room. There's Carol Channing, Rip Taylor. There's John Aston. There's E.D. McClurg, Rob Paulson. Jim Cummings. I mean, it was unbelievable, the cast. Who's who? Now, Cousin It was kind of a trick because what do I do is add a little English in there, mm -hmm. just a little, and play an act over just nonsense. Mm -hmm. So you say something, ask me a question, I'll answer it as Cousin It, and you'll hear a little like, I think I know what he said, but I didn't. What's your favorite color? Oh, yes, I like your car. This is your number. <laughs> Ask me another one. Uh, what's your favorite topping on a pizza? Oh, you cut up with a pepper in your <laughs> Is that so something you got... came up with rifting, or is that the direction you were giving, or? <laughs> no, it just came to me that, you know, I was older, so I was in my 40s, so I knew two things. First of all, it's got to be amusing. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be high because cousin it was high and <laughs> the trick is that people have to think they should have known what he said but they're not sure yeah so when when i talked about the ad or whatever and peppa died about you went oh pepperoni <laughs> you know there's little things or even if it's in my own imagination at least i'm doing it yeah. that's the way cousin nick would talk he'd talk about he'd say blue but he'd go blue you know <laughs> so that was part of it. And I, I so enjoyed doing that. In fact, I, I saw the person that played the woman in that mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, Nancy Olinari. Yeah. It's, we're still pals. And some people are dead. But, yeah. And I think John Aston is still alive and he teaches at William & Mary. He teaches acting. Yeah. Sean's well, dad. When you, another great, great character. He played Raphael in the latest uh, Ninja Turtles in 2012. Yeah, I got to work with him in Chicago on some. Yeah, yeah, we did uh, Twilight Zone together. He's a good actor. On the uh, new series? No, I I did no. He was uh, years ago. Twilight Zone Radio, or uh, it got a lot of awards, but it was audio only. Yeah, based uh, on the old TV stuff. Yeah, it was a fantastic. It's one of those shows that. It's weird because I've hit this stage in my life and I've, I've always heard about it. You start going back and either watching the stuff you did as a kid or your stuff, your, your folks, or your grandparents watched. And I never believed it because I figured I'd just stick with cartoons my entire life. Um, and then Netflix came around. They started putting everything on there. I'm like, oh, man, I remember when Aunt Marianne and Uncle Bob were here. We'd watch this and it was just, you know, uh, Twilight Zone. Have, a fantastic show. I have 263 episodes of Have Gun Will Travel. Yeah. <laughs> At home. It's, I was making a, I was talking to Brad Garrett, who's the funniest man I've ever met in my life. And I was talking about, uh, maybe I should pull out the, the complete movies of Mon Pa Kettle. And he thought I was, he laughed and I sent him a picture of the DVD and it was the, that title. Yeah. I'd actually watched the complete movies of Mon Pa Kettle. It's embarrassing. <laughs> how'd that make you feel <laughs> i loved it yeah <laughs> yeah 
you, you Telling them that, oh, it's, it's embarrassing what I have. I mean, I've only told two other people I have the hive, half gun will travel <laughs> in complete episodes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've mentioned him a couple times. Brad Garrett, man, what a phenomenal voice. And I'm not sure if you remember this show. I'm not sure if you worked on it. But do you remember a show called Two Stupid Dogs? Oh, yeah. I remember the show. I remember he was on it, but I didn't see it. Yeah, he was, uh, he was, it was essentially the title buries the lead in, in it. It's just two dogs, dumb as hell, getting into stuff. And uh, he voiced. The, actor, who's the other actor? He created it. Bill Cummings, maybe? Uh, Mark Schiff was the other guy. He was the Dotson, and then Donovan Cook uh, created it. Uh, I, I don't remember. I think it was a, uh, no, I don't remember it, but I, I love the title, and he's wonderful to work with. Because yeah. he's so funny. And I teach with him, too. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, is he, because I know he's, does he still have his club that he's yeah. working at? Yeah. Okay. Um, Fred Garrett's comedy club is in the MGM, and he hasn't been there in a while. Like, you know, he says, come on out and have dinner or lunch at Malibu. I'm like, yeah, yeah I'll leave Tuesday. <laughs> you know, uh, the thing about Brad is that uh, I make him laugh all the time, and he thinks I'm the funniest man alive. And I go, no, no, I just have your number. <laughs> I got your number, man. I, I know you and, and what references you'll laugh at. Yeah, he's, he's funny. He's, uh, there's a few guys that are like that, like not so much bigger guys, but bigger guys, um, you know, tall, height-wise, weight-wise, that type of thing. And you just look at them, and then no matter what they do, they could say absolutely nothing, but that's just a lift of an eyebrow or a smirk, or they do something yeah. weird, and then you're just in tears and your sides hurt, you yeah. know? And he's phenomenal. Let me tell you a little story, and um, it's worth the time, at least to me. When um, I have uh, three boys that are alive, and I lost my eldest when he was 24. I'm sorry to hear that. Right? And so it was tough. And Brad knew about it. And we had the same mentor. The same mentor was Ron Feinberg. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to love to go to the pantry. Now, that's a restaurant in LA that's been open 24 hours, seven since before the Depression. Wow. Now, here's a picture, and I don't know if you can see it, it doesn't matter, of all my boys at the pantry with Ron Feinberg, right? Mm -hmm. And I had sent a picture to Brad, because Ron told me he had a painting of the pantry mm -hmm. with, the, with the, our favorite counter guy, JJ, who was black haired and mustached. Mm -hmm. Well, he heard that my boy died. He talked to me on the phone. And then a, a few days later, later, to me and my wife, Renee, we got this in the mail. Wow. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a oh, yeah. painting of the pantry of uh with jj over there mm -hmm. right and it was uh it was sent to us and my wife wept and she said you know it's people are so nice to call but i'll always have that painting yeah, that's, i really appreciate this story that's why i like talking to you guys man you guys made my childhood so damn fun and like i said earlier this year has been horrible you know, we've, we've lost yeah. so many great people. It started with Kobe, Chadwick Boseman, you know, Black Panther uh, yeah. a few weeks ago. Yeah. And it's just, it's been horrible. And when I sit here and think about it, and I think about how short time really is, because I yeah. can go to sleep, I'm 31, I can go to sleep tonight and never wake up again, right? And, it, and it's, it's sad, but it, it, it's also, I don't want to say happy, it's nice knowing that nothing is forever, especially when it comes to human beings. And then for me to sit here and talk to you, for me to sit here and talk to Rob, for me to sit and talk to whoever that has made my childhood and my adulthood, and then even my child is my son's life so fun. We've had so many connections with shows, yeah, and movies, yeah. and TVs. You know, I can't thank you guys enough for what you've done. You really made not only my life, but his life and our combined life, you know, so much better. And it's all because of funny voices you know i don't want i don't mean to diminish what you've done but it's, it's oh no for a cartoon you know listen to listen to this when i was your age i first got to uh la mm -hmm. i trained i'd gotten to the street i was 30 years old so i go into my first session which is scooby-doo goes hollywood which by the way variety magazine 
you know, the industry magazine at the time reviewed it and titled it Scooby Doo Doo Doo. Oh, man. So, anyway, so I go into Hanna Barbera. Now, cut to me at nine years old watching Rough and Ready at home, black and white cartoon. I hear these voices, Don Messick and Dawes Butler, the same guys yeah. as what I grew up with. Now, I never was a car cartoon nut, but I love characters. And it was just the voices that I heard. Yeah. And it was a thrill. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, it seems like it's something so simple. But when, like I said earlier, when it's done well, you know. And there hasn't been anything, you and Rob, especially those two guys, and Brad's got a distinct voice that you can almost pick out anywhere. Um, yeah. You know, so it, it's, it's, like I said, it's always nice talking to you guys. It's always fun. Um, you know, we're getting towards that hour. I got to go get my son here in just a little bit from school. However, I always like to end it with this, um, or at least food for thought type of thing. When you hear the term, since this is a Ninja Turtles podcast, but it goes all over the place and I really don't care. I, I'm having fun and I know other people will have fun when they hear this, regardless of it being a turtle podcast or a voice podcast, right? So with that being said, when you've heard that term, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, what's the first thought or what are some of those emotions that elicit in your mind? What, what are those things that get brought to the forefront? Um, it brings, uh, the thought in the forefront is that it was a good era. It yeah. was the most money and was huge money for all of us. And it, it was the surprise of doing something as we've done hundreds of shows, but one of them takes off. It was a huge cultural thing that took off. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing I think about, uh, being in a room with, people that I really enjoyed for nine years. Yeah. It's unparalleled. Yeah. I got to show you something real quick. I don't know if you can see it back here. You know, my, if you looked in my room, it would look like I, I was a serial killer almost. I've got all these toys pointing to all these uh -huh. different places, but I've got you oh, yeah. right there, you know. Uh, later, put it back and don't touch it again. <laughs> You know, so like I said, man, it, it's been so fun. Um, I'm not sure when I'm going to put this one up yet. I am working with a, a company and we're going to be moving stuff. They were the first producers for the first uh, three turtle movies back in the uh -huh. 90s. So we're going to be putting it under their page. So as soon as that's up, um, you know, I'll send you over a link so you can watch it. Um, sure. And um, the last question I want to ask you is for all of the voices you've done, every cartoon you've worked on, Who's the most one you get approached about? Who comes up and says, oh man, I remember you in, is it Casey? Is it Baxter? Is it somebody somebody else or some other cartoon? What's the most frequent one? It's not most frequent. I get Krang, uh, I get uh, Lurky, I get uh, Casey Jones from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I suppose when I get right down to it, it would be Krang. Yeah. But, uh, but since they don't hear it when I'm, you know, I'm at the grocery store going, oh, I have that pack of vanilla. You know, <laughs> they don't know who it is. I have an omitted, an anonymity. Okay, pronounce it for me. Anom anonymous or an anonymity? Anonymity. That's yeah. it. <laughs> so, so that's one of the good parts. So I don't know. I do get kids uh, that are delighted by certain voices yeah. because the voices are funny it's not like you're doing an impression of somebody yeah well pat man it's been a fantastic time you know you guys i told you guys all the time you guys are really doing the lord's work you're making our childhoods my child probably his children eventually hopefully it's after college because i don't want any i don't want any kids in high school six years eight years down the road um, <laughs> i don't need i don't need that kind of strife in my life right now um but you guys are really doing you know, Good. such great things. And I really appreciate you taking the time for me today. Well, it's my pleasure, Julian. Well, you Go have a great boy. What's that? Go get your boy. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm going to. He's in karate now, so he's probably going to want to kick the hell out of me before I go to work. So Exactly. Just let him. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to. I mean, he's only little for so long. But every, so often, every so often, you smack him and say, see? <laughs> 
Well, I break out the well, – little quick story. I break out the pool noodle because he'll, he'll, he's starting to spar now and we're starting to train for tournaments. He just won his first tournament since COVID started um, a couple weeks ago. So he slept with this huge trophy, put it in his bed, um, you know. And then I, we found out the other day he's like six in points right now because it's his first one. He doesn't have, you know, too many points. So he's ranked pretty high. So he's just walking around the kitchen, almost like a little Bruce Lee stance, right? He's got his little his little thing on. He's like, I'm sixth in the state. I'm sixth in the state. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a little character, man. But uh, once again, man, thank you again. You have a okay. great day. Stay safe, and then I'll talk to you soon. Yes, I look forward to it. Bye-bye.